Hello and welcome to our Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid electric vehicle case study. Um, this is a long one, I do apologise, it's an hour and a half long, so if you want to break it down into a few sections to digest the information. It looks at an isolation fault and the big clue is the fact that the fault is only there when the road wheels are rotating. We're going to look at numerous techniques. Uh, we're going to follow the manufacturer flowchart for the particular fault code and see where that takes us and then look at measurements and techniques outside of the box. So uh, sit back and enjoy. It is a long one. I do apologise, but um, there's a lot to be gained. Mitsubishi Outlander with a fault code P1A44. This is in the battery monitoring unit and it's earth leak detection so it's found a leak somewhere on the high voltage system um, it comes with a huge um, i think it's 40 section flow chart from the vehicle manufacturer on how to challenge this fault how to diagnose this fault um, we'll follow that and see where it leads us to um, there's a big clue though that the code or the fault only appears this is the leak fault when you actually pull away so the vehicle has to be in motion we'll follow the chart and see how it goes Okay, so um, ignition is turned on. We are in ready mode. All fault codes have cleared down now. And um, I'm gonna select drive. So I've just heard drive disengage or park disengage. I'm just gonna pull forward. Ah, oh, that's okay. Let's just go back. There's a thump from the rear diff. I think that's a diff mount apparently. There we go. And now we've got um, ACC service required, RBS service required, EV system service required. As I mentioned at the start of the video, this is the um, flow chart that is supplied courtesy of Mitsubishi for detecting this fault. So this is what you would have to follow. Uh, what I do like is the um, the judgment, so the um, trouble judgment, the check conditions are that the power supply mode of the electric motor switch is on, which it is, or the drive battery starts to be charged, which that side's not relevant. And what is detected is an earth fault in the high voltage system. It says here that no backup function is available. Um, I find that interesting because this vehicle would still drive, albeit with low power, so even with a known earth fault on the high voltage system, it still allowed power to both motors, front and rear. This is good, probable causes. Um, earth fault of high voltage system component. Yes, that could be. Uh, quick charge contactors, positive and negative are stuck on. We don't have any charging issues. The drive battery earth fault detector is failed. Now that is possible, isn't it? The, the actual sensor itself that's responsible for detecting an earth fault is itself at fault. And then open circuits of the drive battery earth fault detector circuit, short circuits to earth, short circuits to power supply system, or damage poor contact of the connector. Um, or the BMU, the battery monitoring unit has failed. So yeah, I think we can certainly say one, two, three, four of those five could be our cause, could be the reason why we've got this scenario. Uh, and I will quickly just scroll through this so you can see how long this flow chart is. Um, if, if, I hope this doesn't uh, play with your eyes too much, but we are, you can see there, I'm just whizzing through steps to 27, 32, uh, 39, and we finish, oh, we keep going past 40. Uh, sorry, that is 45 steps, potential steps, depending on results as you pass through the full flow chart. And for ease and for speed, I've actually started to populate this so you can see uh, the tests that were carried out. So here we go. Um, yeah, is the code stored? Um, it says there, wait 20 seconds after turning on the power supply mode of the electric motor switch and shift the lever, uh, select a lever in park. Um, 
bit of a grey one this is because if you noticed when this vehicle was in park in ready mode this fault would not occur the fault only occurs when you pull away so there's not quite the right description there but I did go with yes uh, as the full code is stored as soon as we pull away moving on to step two then it is um, insulation test inside the battery so what we're going to do here is remove the service plug follow the instructions here it wants us to insulation test inside the battery at 500 volts so it's important we set the tester accordingly gloves on at this point and um, well let's have a look at the results so first of all we've got um, the diagram which will help so let me just move this over so we can make room for the diagram and let's just pull this aside so we can see exactly where we are so um, disconnect the service plug here's the service plug remove that and we carry out an insulation test so we are testing 500 volts this line here which is inside the battery so up to the charge contactor the main contactor positive main contactor negative because we go in this direction to vehicle ground and in this direction to vehicle ground and no we're actually passing through the cells within the battery because that's exactly what the service plug does it breaks up or interrupts the circuit between the cells so the cells being wired in series remove this we've got one half here to test and one half there okay hope that helps um, that result was normal so now we move on to step six now this was voltage measurement at the battery drive battery connector drive battery earth fault detector power supply line so again disconnect the connector and measure at the wiring harness side operate the electric motor switch without depressing the brake pedal and turn on the power supply um, and check the voltage so again let's get the wiring diagram up it will make things much easier so let me move this across here and the diagram this time is this one here okay and what it's asking us to do is voltage measurement at drive battery connector well the drive battery connector is this one here 1 12 13 it's number two here so it's a multi-block connector uh, and more importantly it's this voltage here that we're looking at this is from the ignition control relay the power supply to the drive battery ground fault detector which makes perfect sense if you think about it because if this voltage has dropped um, we're not going to have any detection at all so a worthy check so rather than use a multimeter there we'll actually use picoscope so let me bring in this capture here and this is the power supply to the um, leak detector so the sensor responsible for um, ground leak detection as you can see during the power up there's a little bit of a flutter it drops down 11.9 uh, and then certainly when the dc dc charging comes up there there we are 14.4 and that remains stable throughout what's interesting on this power supply is just look at the noise level on there as we start to um, either drive the vehicle or maybe engage drive I'm not sure so um, again vehicle stationary in drive in reverse but that's normally characteristic and we can clear that down so if we um, apply some filtering and we should see that there we are so don't be alarmed when you see that kind of noise as long as you don't get voltage dropping down to zero and springing back up and down like this it's um that's not good that was that that's okay what we see there so to clarify what that test was that was the power supply here and this is the point where we can measure it's only at this point so this is the drive battery this is the main connector it's actually this one here it's d33 okay and it is pin two so we probed in here and we know certainly up to this point what we don't know is that the supply is good from that point to the uh, fault detector itself but 
at this stage we'll run with it. So we'll say that our result there was normal. Uh, go to step seven, uh, perform resistance measurement at battery drive connector, drive battery earth fault detector, body earth line. So disconnect the connector and measure at the wiring harness sign. Check the resistance between the drive battery connector, this one here, uh, and body earth. So it's asking us to do earth continuity, isn't it? Which is pretty much this line here. Okay, so that's pin 11 to ground. Once again, we can use Picascope for that because the 4425A has a resistance lead. So here we have that capture. So this is um, testing the ground using the Pico resistance lead. So we are, well, we've got continuity, haven't we? And let me just clarify what that test was. That would have been disconnecting this connector here and measuring from this point, point 11, to chassis ground to confirm that we've got a good ground there. And I think um, minus 74 milliamp is certainly good ground. Um, that was test seven. So now we go to test eight. And test eight is, sorry, a check of damage in drive battery earth fault detector supply. And that's between uh, the ignition control relay and the drive battery. So what it's saying there is, um, well, let's have a look at another diagram because hopefully it will explain a bit better. Uh, and I think it's this one here. Yeah, so here is our ignition control relay. So when that energizes via fuse 11, that then feeds various circuits off to the quick charge contactor relay, um, but also to other circuits inside the battery, one of which is our leak detector. So that is back to this one here. So I didn't quite fully understand what that was saying, um, unless we're gonna intrude inside the battery. So let's just go through that again. Check of damage in drive battery, sorry. Yeah, in drive battery earth fault detector power supply. I think based on that summary, we could probably go back to our original capture here, looking at the power supply to the ground fault detector. And that is fine. And once again, that's as far as we go at this point, because um, for, for us to obtain, uh, let me try and get them side by side, there we go. For us to obtain that result there, the integrity of the circuit up to that point, remember this is under load as well, because I did drive this vehicle after with this connected and you know, or I didn't say that to do that in the flow chart, it was just additional load I wanted to apply. So I think the only thing we can, um, and I don't want to say or use the word assume, but I think we can say up to that point, we're okay, which means the integrity of the circuit from the ignition control relay to that point is good as well and that this is the only grey area, which is inside the battery unit. So on to step nine then. Um, check of a short circuit, uh, or short to earth, and short to power supply, and an open in the sensing line between the BMU connector and the drive battery connector. And so this is the line here, sensing line, and uh, PRCK, that is the pre-check line as well, because that comes up in test 10. So I'll go through these now, but it's probably worth explaining what these actually do. Uh, once again, courtesy of Mitsubishi, um, here we have a description of the ground fault detector. So there's our power supply coming in from the ignition control relay. We've tested up to that point and we're good. Um, as you read through the information here, it says here, the drive battery ground fault detector has the ground fault. How I interpret that, it means it already has um, a short to ground by which to compare a short to ground in the high voltage system. So that's my interpretation. Now, um, when a ground fault occurs in the high voltage circuit, so whenever there is a short to ground, chassis ground in this system here, 
the drive battery fault detector should output the voltage into the BMU battery monitoring unit which is separate from the battery so this device is inside the battery this side is outside right hand rear quarter panel okay so here's our sense circuit and there is our uh, sorry that is our pre-check circuit that will be our sense circuit so at the, initially what it's asking us to do is um, continuity check and short circuit test these wires here okay so let me just go back to the wiring diagram there's the wires and I can confirm that continuity from the BMU to the battery connector on both sense and pre-check were both good also shorts to positive and shorts to ground were good and more importantly short to one another there was nothing there at all what I did do is I left this connector disconnected from the BMU but then left it connected inside the battery here just to see if I could get um, any indication of a short circuit inside the battery so in other words rather than disconnecting here and here and just having a free length of cable I disconnected from here and left it connected to the battery so then I could see if there was anything internal there were values I think there were I think 7.8 kilo ohms on a couple of them on one of them sorry um, needless to say the reason for that there was no real um, specification for that it was just to see that we hadn't got a short inside there that was the best we could do with that situation but better still um, why not measure these with picoscope because we can actually see the activity on these cables when we turn the ignition on and when the fault occurs uh, whilst there didn't appear to be any so looking at the pre-check and sense wiring here we have the activity on these cables and this is always a grey area because we don't know what should be present on these cables other than the short description that we saw there with the um, leak detector or short circuit sensor description and operation what's happened here is uh, at ignition on we've got a uh, pulse uh, present on the sense wire for uh, approximately one and a half seconds give or take we then get the pre-check activity so this is the BMU now sending out the pre-check signal to the leak detector and then the leak detector responds here by sending this voltage back and then they both return to whatever their baseline levels are it looks as though the sensing wire is around about let's have a look about 0.9 and the pre-check well that the pre-check switch is off there at that point so this looks to be the BMU testing the operation of the leak detector and the leak detector responding so up to that point from what I can work out that is fine that is normal this is where it gets a little bit grey because now um, there's really nothing else comes from the BMU in terms of pre-check this is just noise this is where I'm now running the vehicle on the ramp so that it's on a wheel free ramp we're spinning the wheels and the fault occurs it doesn't occur in this point here but maybe it didn't occur for long enough um, I'll run the video now you'll be able to see a video shortly of this being captured live I would have thought that was enough time nevertheless on the next run so this is me accelerating again on the ramp for a little bit longer nine and a half seconds at that point warning lights come on uh, and we've got the same fault code again leak detected so this looks to be the leak detector functioning as normal i think we can almost move on and say this is not the leak detector sensor that is actually faulty Climbing into vehicle.
put on brake, ignition on, ready mode on, no warning lights. Close the door, select drive, release pedal, driving OK, driving OK, bolts appeared, put on brake, select park, Ignition off. Open door. So with those checks in place, we move now to step 11. It's asking us to measure BMU terminal voltage. Uh, disconnect the drive battery connector. Operate the electric motor switch without depressing the brake pedal and turn on the power supply mode of electric motor switch. Check the voltage between the BMU connector, sense terminal and body ground. So um, with this disconnected, sense terminal and ground. Uh, it's saying it should be system voltage. Uh, well, what is system voltage? I guess theoretically it's 12 volt or is it 5 volt? Um, I don't know where we would reference or find that information from. I've actually gone with yes, this is normal. So now we jump to 13. Um, measure uh, measure uh, BMU connector uh, pre-check terminal. Same again, check the, um, break the switch electric motor, check the voltage between BMU connector, pre-check terminal and body earth. The voltage is changed. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean it, it's gone from one level to another? And what should those levels be? I, I don't know, a grey area once again. Um, I've gone with yes, and we'll go step 14. Um, is the diagnosis code stored? Well, yes, it still is. Every time you pull away, you will have this fault. So that takes us on to step 15 then. And here we go. Uh, check up a short to earth, short to power supply, an open circuit damaging power supply line between the drive battery connector and drive battery earth fault detector connector. So because we now uh, are intrusive, we've removed the battery tray cover, or we would have done, or, or following the flow chart we should, it wants us to check the integrity of these cables here. And um, well, we're gonna assume that's okay. Uh, we'll go to uh, 16 next, which is um, same again for Sort of damage in the earth line so that's this line here and then the same for the sense and the pre-check so really 16 17 15 16 and 17 all talk about these cables here and the integrity thereof inside the battery um, is the check result normal well we can't honestly say because we haven't been inside there but thanks to using the scope, we know the functionality of this is correct. We also know that it returns a sense signal back to the BMU when the fault occurs. So on that, we know it's working. So we have to assume that the results of those checks, 15, 16 and 17, would be normal. In which case it says replace the drive battery earth fault detector then reassemble the drive battery assembly. So that is going to be misdiagnosis. We know that that is not going to cure it. So at this point, we have to step away from the flow chart. Again, courtesy of Mitsubishi, uh, the wiring diagrams we need to refer to now, because we've got to think outside of the box. Um, the flow chart has led us astray a little bit um, but we've got some classic symptoms that we can work with. Um, we know that this vehicle generates the leak detection code when the wheels are turning. So when the vehicle is in motion. Um, let's just imagine for a second these contactors are closed. 
so the vehicle is in ready mode and this is high voltage in the orange and they all come down to C, D and E and F. Okay, so nothing via the charge contactor because this is a pre-charge, this will be energized at ignition on um, moving from on to ready mode and then we'll disengage once these are fully closed. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Let's have a look at this one here. So this is where C, D and E, F terminate ultimately. You've got the power drive unit, which is in the front, and the rear motor control unit, of course, mounted um, accordingly for the rear motor. So when the system is energised, these orange lines here all have high voltage present, yet the fault does not occur. So we can safely say here that the aircon compressor can't be an issue, neither can the onboard charger DC-DC converter, likewise neither can the electric heater. So we've eliminated those immediately, leaving us pretty much three items to consider, the front motor, the generator and the rear motor. Now on this vehicle, the front power drive unit assembly consists of two three-phase motors. One is a generator, the other is a motor that actually drives the road wheels. So as crude as the next stage is, what we need to do is try and eliminate one of these or maybe two of these motors, leaving us just one to focus on. This one is quite easy because there is a button that we can press inside the cabin that will fire the engine and the engine will run and operate the generator and so generate HV. Let's try that, see how that goes. Next one, uh, crude may, as, as though it may be, but we could disconnect one of these motors. Now that is gonna generate fault codes, of course. Uh, it may even shut the system down, I don't know, but we'll see as we move on. Um, leaving us ultimately just one motor with a short circuit. So testing the motor generator at the front, um, so I'm looking over the bonnet, so um, on the left hand side, which is the off side, we've got three phases motor generator, I believe, and on the uh, right hand side, which is the near side, we've got motor generator, or, a, or I think is a generator, and that's what we're connected to. So I'm referenced to high voltage negative, and I'm connected to one of those phases. When I press the charge button, I can actually um, get an output from that generator with no isolation fault, which is intriguing. So here we go. Right. clarify that previous video here we have the phase voltage at the front motor responsible for rotating the front road wheels so let's have a look here uh, this is where I'm connected so I'm connected to I think it was the W phase to start with so it was this one here reference to high voltage negative okay so whichever one of these is negative so high voltage W phase to high voltage negative. And this was the activity. Um, let's just have a look at voltages. So here we have 129 volts is present. And then this is when I started the engine using the generator button. So let's just zoom in here and have a look what activity is going on. It looks like we have some form of control. There we are. And let's have a look at the frequency of that. Our measurements. We'll have um, 
frequency and we'll go uh, between the rulers we'll make that large as well so 10 kilohertz so it looks like a fixed frequency across there and let's also have a look at the average voltage we'll also put that through as a measurement as well so the mean value of channel a between the rulers so 38 volt at 10 kilohertz while the engine was running but that was not the, the motor that was turning let's just go back to the diagram again the motor generator that was turning was this one. This is the one that rotates when you press the charge button. Now, hopefully to simplify that a little bit, here's the drivetrain arrangement for the Outlander. So there's your motor generator that is connected to the engine. So this is used as a starter motor to start the engine. And when the engine is running, this becomes a generator. We have this clutch here. And then this is the front motor generator. So this is responsible for driving the road wheels. And this is the one that we're measuring the voltage on. What I find interesting is this is stationary, yet we still have voltages on those phases. It's this motor here, or this generator, acting as a generator that is rotating. So what is going on there? I think the explanation, well the only explanation I think of is that we've got some kind of a holding phase that is um, keeping the front motor that is responsible for driving the road wheels in a um, fixed position, almost like acting as a brake. So if you've got uh, all three phases controlled in a certain fashion, you can actually um, break the motor, hold that motor still. So it may be a sort of holding fate and holding strategy to stop the front electric motor that drives the road wheels turning due to torque reaction in response to the front motor generator that's connected to the engine. Now, they are separated by this clutch because there are times when this engine can connect to the road wheels via this clutch. So there is your drivetrain through there. So maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe there is a, a potential for this to try and rotate uh, as a reaction to this rotating. What I thought would be good would be to create some reference waveforms and just look at all the phases and just see if there's anything between them. With the rulers removed, we're looking now again at W phase to high voltage negative. We'll create a reference waveform. So we'll duplicate channel A and then we'll give that a name so uh, we'll call this W phase get that in capitals W phase we'll give it a colour something that we're not using so it's quite bold we'll save that we'll just put that as W phase and click save We'll then pull in another waveform. So now we've got uh, the V phase I'm bringing in here now. So this was the same procedure. Um, just turn ignition on, ready mode, press the start button. Front wheels, rear wheels are stationary. The vehicle is not moving. And the only motor that's turning is the generator in response to uh, the engine now running in this period here. Same again. And uh, charging the system. So we'll go reference waveform again, A, we will call this now V phase, give that a, quite a bright colour, we'll save that, and that's simply going to be B phase. And then uh, final one was a uh, new phase and we can leave this on screen again same procedure but nothing has changed but we can bring back the references that we created from the file location so we'll bring back these uh, sorry these two 
open. There we are. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have a trigger on there. Uh, again, hindsight being a wonderful thing, it would have been great to have a trigger so we've got this almost matching. Um, it would also have been, I would have been responsible for trying to press the stop button at exactly the right time. Analyzing these waveforms then. So we've got the W phase there. Uh, let's bring the blue one down. Let's try and get some separation. Uh, I think we can conclude really that they're very much uh, much of a muchness. Uh, let's look at the voltages. Um, peak there, 134. 135. Uh, it was at 130, maybe if I was a little bit more accurate with that ruler. Yeah, give or take. Okay, um, frequencies as well. I mean, we, we, let's, let's see if we can get uh, an area where they plateau. It's kind of here, isn't it? In that zone there. Let's see what the frequencies are. So again, measurements. Um, we'll go for frequency of um, A, V, W. Let's put them small as well. Uh, so, sorry, let me get this right. So, frequency of um, W phase and V phase. There we are. And then we'll go between the rulers. Five kilohertz. That's interesting. We have got more time though, haven't we? We've got uh, half a second um, by comparison to what we had before, but that's that's interesting. Let's, let's zoom in on that and see if there's anything that's I've um, I've mistaken or misinterpreted. Well. Not so. Okay. Just going back to that, actually. Look at that um, U phase, which is blue, by comparison to the smoothness of. Uh, let me just scale up here. So I'm just rolling over the y axis using the thumb wheel. You've definitely got sort of a. Uh, almost like a a stepped, jagged, sporadic sort of um, flow, formation to this waveform. And three phases, um, all things being equal, should be the same. Um, of course they will be out of phase, but we can't rely on phase measurement here because they were just captured individually. They weren't all captured at the same time. But their formation, we certainly can. So that, that is interesting. Once again, remember, this motor is not rotating. I believe this to be a holding strategy. Um, let's just go to the Views button and uh, we'll reset the layout. They all seem to have this um, event here, this final, I think this was a ignition off. It looks to be some kind of a, a discharge event. It's certainly a, a controlled strategy, isn't it? There, um, a pulsing of the voltage in those phases, which slowly decays. Let's have a look here. Yeah, okay. All right, so to clarify, then, um, all those phases appear to be behaving the same or behaving the same. And when the generator is running, there are no fault codes. You wouldn't know there was a problem with the vehicle. Uh, this voltage here is into the front electric motor responsible for driving the front row wheels. Okay. So other than what we found in the blue phase, uh, this is U, this sort of jagged um, formation we haven't really found anything concrete, but it's all evidence once again. It's all part of um, diagnosis and we'll take what we can get at this stage.
So we'll do that now until the isolation fault occurs. Let's analyse that capture then, because it's a completely different strategy to what we had before. So we're still connected to that same motor, this is U phase, reference to high voltage negative. But the only difference is the vehicle's off the ground and we're driving. Both front and rear wheels were turning as well. So again, bear that in mind because the fault only occurs when the vehicle is being driven. So it's probably a good idea to pull back the reference waveform as a reminder. Doesn't matter which one we pull back. Yeah, that was the strategy used, wasn't it? To, I believe, hold that this motor still that's connected to the front road wheels. Completely different to what we're seeing here. Um, the fault occurred, if you remember, right at the end of this capture. So it was either in here. Zoom right in. Or on the next buffer. Let's go to the next buffer. Let's zoom out. Let's zoom in. Again, using the mouse wheel, the thumb wheel, to just roll over the graph view. Now, I don't see anything to suggest a short circuit there. On that particular phase, anyway. Again, with hindsight, what I should have done was done all three phases and had a current clamp on as well, because a current clamp might have been um, an indication of, of what, a better indication of what was going on with this motor based on current flow. Either way, it is what it is. So I, I don't see anything there, even though we know the fault occurred at this point. So I guess it could be the rear motor, because... We're not measuring the rear motor yet, the rear motor is turning. We know we have an isolation fault, but it doesn't indicate front or rear. Um, let's remove the reference waveform and just show you a few more tools at our disposal here. Um, we've got maths, we've got built-in maths. We could go, um, let's go the positive duty of A. Now you might think, my God, that's a mess. Well, yeah, let's just, amend the scale a little bit. I'm just rolling the thumb wheel over the y-axis again and we can see that during these uh, high frequency periods our duty control of this phase is 50%. These events here are to do with uh, noise and some form of excitation that's going on in this section of the waveform. whether that links quite well to what we saw previously, where we seem to have that um, sort of jagged formation to the phase. Uh, it's worth looking at this area here. No, no, different formation, isn't it? Let's just scale up a little bit so we can see a bit more. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's get rid of that and let's add uh, frequency A. And again, frequency, now then, frequency has changed, looking at that. Uh, we are at uh, 2.9 kilohertz. Remember, motor speed is dependent on frequency. So, that's intriguing. 
frequency of voltage, frequency of current. Food for thought. I need to check that. Okay, well, the, there is a direct relationship between the two. So, okay. Um, word to the wise about filtering. Because we could try and filter some of this noise out here that's been detected by the math channel. Um, let's go on to the next buffer because the next buffer shows it really well. Remember this event here, this uh, what we believe to be some kind of uh, discharge or uh, strategy control right at the end of the, the capture. This is when we power down. Uh, it's clear as a bell there. But if we operate uh, or introduce filtering, sorry, filtering, and let's, uh, let's, okay, active, that's 50 kilohertz, low pass filter, and then we'll bring that down. And let's bring that down to something quite considerable. Uh, let's try 10 kilohertz and see what happens there. Move the zoom off there. Now then, look at that, how it's changed that formation there. That may lead you to believe that this is now behaving differently uh, from the ignition off event when we were just looking at uh, running the generator. So again, be aware of that, that filtering can trip you over. So um, always catch it dirty and then filter accordingly. Let's filter that a bit more. Let's come down to something like um, half again, so that's five kilohertz. And see how that changes the waveform. Yeah. Okay, so does not tell the full story, does it there? That looks all very um, controlled and efficient. And um, when we actually remove the filter, let's take that off. It is completely different, isn't it? All right, I hope that helps. Okay, to recap where we are and to summarize, we know that when the generator is running, we don't generate the full code. We know when the front and the rear motors are running, spinning, we generate a fault code. We haven't found anything of concern in either, um, well, certainly when the generator is running, we don't have a code. We found nothing of concern in the front motor. We have done no measurements at all on the rear motor. So I mentioned earlier on in this uh, video, um, almost a crude approach to diagnosis and I thought well why don't we just disconnect one of these motors and run the car with the vehicle uh, sorry with the, the vehicle raised on the ramp and, and see what happens so that's exactly what we did um, disconnect a front motor from the inverter from the power drive unit um, again be careful this is uh, all high voltage and it's all live so it's uh, personal protection gloves of course qualification, certification, etc, etc. Um, I did come across these, um, which I thought were quite cool, was when you are disconnecting um, high voltage cables from inverters, etc. These protective tubes, uh, I chose to show all three there because we've got three, three different diameters. It's just nice to keep um, protection over the terminals uh, so that we don't get dust or debris or contamination. Uh, which ultimately increases uh, resistance and we're always looking at milliohm resistance when we look at high voltage connections. Um, this is what happened anyway. So um, before I disconnected the front motor, so this is both motors connected and driving front and rear road wheels, we had isolation fault. This was the one we were diagnosing, wasn't it? P1A44. With the front motor disconnected, and only rear wheels driving the rear road wheels, we no longer had an isolation fault, which is great. So we're actually onto something there. Um, I did look up this code, um, POBFD. Uh, it calls that three phase line fails, three phase line failure. Well, that's not surprising because the front motor is disconnected. So I am happy now that we have a short circuit 
in the front motor that drives the front road wheels. Not the generator that's driven by the engine, the front motor drives the front road wheels. So here we have the first measurement looking at voltage and current. Channel A is connected to a differential probe and we are across the phases there, so that's phase U and V. And then three current clamps here, so around each phase. Not always possible, we don't always have the luxury of getting across the three phases because it may be integral with the power electronics inverter assembly. Um, be, please be careful, this is live working, so it's gloves on certification, qualification, uh, PPE for everyone around as well. Uh, right, the idea was that we would spin this and look uh, or capture the absolute precise moment where the short circuit occurred or this isolation failure and see what effects that had on voltage and current. That was the plan. Let's see what happened. That's ready on. Select part. Pull away, accelerate, warning lights on, ready off. I did accelerate then as well, just applied a bit of gas. Yeah, it's pretty much there, so we'll save all that. Wow. Can't believe it rotates when there's such a short. So here's that waveform. Um, let's break it down a little bit for ease of viewing. So we get a fuse and auto range. Uh, this was when we selected park, sorry, uh, drive from park. You could hear the uh, pole disengaged there. Um, this is the differential probe across phases U and V and when we actually get going that's typically what you'd expect to see. That's quite normal. That's phase to phase. Uh, and more importantly look at the current. So I was hoping to see some kind of short, dropout, spike, whatever it may be. Let's follow this along to the end. It was around here that we had our uh, warning light on. Uh, this looks to be just me coming to the uh, taking foot off the gas pedal at that point simply because the warning lights come on. Perhaps with hindsight I should have just kept it down to see what happened but you could still drive on low power. Either way that looks okay. I don't think we can draw any conclusion from that. I think these should align pretty good. They're out of phase as you'd expect 120 degrees. There's nothing really stand out there. So I'm either missing something, and I hope not, um, or we'll move on to the XY view, uh, the Martins method, and see if we can see anything there with uniformity, because ideally we're looking for that perfect circle. Should have caught that acceleration. Okay, here we have the test from the uh, video previously. This is um, test 11 X and Y. Not much of an acceleration, it was just a quick blip on the throttle and that was to see if we could generate a short. Uh, what we're looking for is the perfect circle. Um, we're far from perfect here of course but I don't believe that's a fault. Uh, a lot of this hashing that we see here is exactly what we see here in the time domain. Just look how noisy that signal is. So this is current. Um, 
we seem to have different sawtooth on each of these so that is worth noting um, either way it's had quite an effect on this circle that we're after here I think 28 is the, the sweet spot for trying to find a circle uh, we've got nothing shooting off that's for certain or nothing intruding into the center there uh, I think maybe trying some filtering will help let's see what happens I've got quite an aggressive filter on here at 500 Hertz you can see the effects actually as we filter because the only channel that's not filtered now is channel D and look how that affects the XY view um, you just put that filter on there okay so it has cleaned things up but I think this uh, unevenness to the sine wave is being represented here in the XY view so um, I'm not uh, wholly convinced at this point we could call anything from that current although the sawtooth we mentioned just previously is, is of concern um, point to note about XY view is when you are viewing you can actually change them to a one to one aspect ratio and it's probably the best way to view XY because that way you'll be assured of um, a one to one ratio so the uh, X and Y scales will be the same um, in fact, because I have scaled this up, we're no longer going to get that. So let me just, there we are, that is better. Because I've scaled these for better viewing. So there's a point to note as well. Okay, um, sorry, let's do this one in views on and the same again for this one here. So yeah, point to note try and view these in a one-to-one -one aspect ratio and be careful that um, like I've just done there we could get that scenario when you scale up of course high voltage our first measurement is a zero potential check so making sure there is no voltage and this system is safe so the vehicle has been shut down two pole tester here gloves on of course um, first thing press the button on the two pole tester join the probes together and the two pole tester responds with a bleep uh, now apply those probes to a known voltage hopefully we can see there we have nine volts um, not sure if that's coming through on the video yet but it's lit up blue that's a safe working voltage now apply this across the DC okay and that no response from the two pole tester no alarms no red lights and then just come back to the nine volt check and there it is so we know that this is now at zero volt okay so we want to um, carry out an insulation test on this vehicle so we're going to open up the insulation tester with DMM software Click on the meter and we also want to pair it so here we need to put the meter in pairing mode so we press and hold this button here and we see the icon flashing notice the dongle is connected and the dongle is flashing that's connected by usb uh, we click on instruments click pair and we can see now that the meter position in the software corresponds to the meter position on the meter so if I turn this dial we should see that change let me do that once more there we are so we want to want the real-time chart instrument real-time chart recording there's our sample rate let's make this full size and we'll go for data list okay so at the moment you'll see there that the meter is sending across data Notice here that we are referenced to ground, or we're going to check for a short circuit to ground. We'll have our gloves on at this point because we are about to send 500 volts through the system, which is the correct voltage. Press and hold the test button. We see there that we've got a short circuit. And our test voltage is just 6 volts, even though we've selected 500 volts. So there is a short. And it's the same on each winding 
And if I press the USB button here, yeah, we stop plotting. What I can do now, we can save these results. So, file, save, and by default, that will go into the um, installation test with DMM folder. It'll save a, a dot .recorder file. Um, when you actually view that folder, you'll also find in there an Excel file. So we'll save that. So once that's saved, you can then reopen and choose to graph that accordingly within Excel. So here we have the software. This is the Milliohm and motor tester software, and we want to perform an electric motor test. So double click on the icon. It's a USB device. We'll follow this around. And here it is, Milliohm meter motor tester, USB. And you'll notice six leads on the front. It's actually a three wire test we're going to perform. The software now is asking us to accept the message and also acknowledge the message as well, more importantly. And here is the menu. And let's have a look at the connections. So uh, six wires and they attach to Kelvin clips because this is actually a six wire measurement. But we're gonna measure each phase in one hit. So we're gonna measure the resistance between UV, VW and WU. You'll notice in the back of the tester as well, there's an additional cable here. This is a temperature probe. And if we follow that down, that just rests on the transmission there. You can see that there. All right, so here we go. We press the stop button. The software is now running and you'll see in the software that we've actually got a temperature value top right hand corner, 73.8 Fahrenheit. Notice how it's doing a resistance check through each coil. It's waiting for the voltage to stabilize and it's then also reversing as well. So that's allowing for any um, dissimilar metal issues or connectivity issues. So we'll measure the uh, resistance in one direction and then the other, then find the average. Uh, I can't stress enough just how important it is to have good connections when it comes to uh, this check. Um, resistance, uh, milliohm resistance increases dramatically with poor connection. So if you've got a poor connection at your cable, um, we're gonna have a, an error in the measurement. And as we can see here, a number of issues already. Between U and V, let us just actually see what happens when um, we take the U phase down to ground. Let's find out what, how that has changed. Now we've, uh, we're gonna measure phase V to U, but U is actually now at ground. So let's see how this has changed. Yeah, that kind of reinforces this um, concern we have that we'd spotted with the ice, uh, isolation test, the insulation test, that we do have a short to ground. Yeah. Notice temperature compensated there. Of course, that has changed. We've got such a huge deviation between phases. That is a fail. So it's a test over and above the isolation test. the new milliohm tester from Pico. So you'll notice here that we have two leads. Remember this is going to be a four wire measurement. We've got the red marker on the test lead to go into the red four mil connection socket on the device. And we'll try and connect or we will connect exactly as it says there. So we'll have U, V and W as we've labeled up. So you are here is going to be blue. Connection is paramount when you're doing this because uh, any connection error is going to result in an increase in milliohm resistance. 
Uh, next up is V, and then finally W. Now I'm going to let those hang because I don't want in any way the weight of the cables pressing down on the clock, clock clip so as to relieve the pressure on the connector. Remember, we've got temperature compensation here as well. Temperature probe is simply dropped into the motor assembly. Uh, this has been out of the vehicle for quite some time now. We'll open up the uh, milliohm meter software and we'll click on electric motor test. Uh, accept the warning and this pretty much is as straightforward as it gets. If you just notice in the pictogram here that we actually test by passing current through the winding, we start with U and V. We then reverse that current. That allows for any uh, thermal EMF effect from um, differential metals being connected to um, uh, connections and via crock clips, etc. And finally, we come to the last phase, W to U, and there we have it, a balance motor. Um, yeah, 19 milliohm, 18.8, and 19 milliohm. And the bar graph there, that pretty much tells us that those phases are balanced. Now, depending on specification, that is either a good or bad. Um, I, I believe that is okay for that motor. The balance is what's important there, but just grasp for a second how low that resistance is. 18 milliohm, 19 milliohm. It's a tiny, tiny resistance. Um, on that subject, if ever you do get an erroneous measurement, um, repeat the test. So, sorry, before you repeat the test, take your clips off, reapply them, and repeat the test. Um, just see what happens. If you then get a good result, that was obviously a connection error. If it's the same phase with the same error, then that is most probably a true erroneous reading and then of course we have to diagnose further with the motor. So um, notice there we did I guess you could argue have balance with this but this read approximately 50 milliohm per phase. The actual true reading using this four wire method was 19, 18, 19 give or take so far more accurate using the milliohm meter with far better resolution. Okay, so um, coming back to this motor, we do have a problem. The balance of the phases were good. What I'd like you to look at now is the resistance to ground. Um, so what we're gonna do is between phase V and to ground, we'll go to ground on the motor here. We have a measurement value there of 63 ohm. We'll then go between phase V and ground, that's 77 ohm. And between W and ground, 77 ohm again. So there's something quite interesting there is that on V and W, we had same resistance value, but on U to ground, we had something different again. So much less resistance between phase U to ground than V and W. So how could that be of diagnostic value? What we're saying here is if we refer to the chart here, that the resistance between U and ground is less than between V and ground and W and ground. So, if we were to just draw that, how we think what we could have uh, or where that fault could be or where or what we could be looking at here. Um, if U to ground was the least resistance, we could be looking at something like, exaggerated, but let's go with this here. Uh, short to ground in this motor could be there because the resistance here was it 63 milliohm, something like that. But from here to that point, was it about 77, something like that? And again here. So based on that, 
that would certainly incorporate more resistance as would this here because you're traveling through this coil. So theoretically, it looks like we could be looking at something between U to ground or certainly a less resistance, um, least path of resistance to ground from U to the ground point. Okay, just to recap before we actually dismantle this motor, we're set up to measure the phase resistance U to ground. So you see there we are 64 milliohm on U to ground. There's our ground clip, there's our U clip. Um, just to quickly run through again as a quick refresher, what had we got on the V phase? 77. And same again, we were 77 on the W phase as well. All right, so we'll leave that logging whilst we take components off. Remember, we are temperature compensated, so the results in the top there are the current measurements and the results underneath are temperature compensated. So, yeah, at 14 degrees, we'll be actually adding a resistance value because uh, we know as temperature increases with positive temperature coefficient that the resistance of the copper will increase too. All right, let's get going. All right, so we'll just take this drain plug out. I want to see if there's any fluid in there. If there is, of course, we'll get the drain um, bucket underneath it. But uh, let's just... No. And we're still at 64. So let's see if I can... No. So fluid-wise, nothing inside there that's giving us this issue from what we can see. All right, so now we'll start dismantling. So just relocated the earth because we start by taking the end plate off here. Um, I'm not sure whether it will come apart, but let's just see. There's a little bit of jumping around in the log in there, but that may well be to do with connection here. Ultimately, it could be something to do with this end plate. Okay, so that's all bolts removed. Still at 64 milliohm. We'll just give that a tap and see if that changes our resistance. That's a good sound. Ah, now then, that is interesting. We've gone up to 76, which ironically, 77 was the other values. And nothing is changing. This is still gripped here gone back down to 64. This is still a good connection here. It does have an effect, it appears to anyway. Okay. Okay, so we'll break away there. Um, we'll try a few pry bars, see if we can get that movement. I'm not sure that's held with something else or maybe even magnetism. Um, yeah, so we'll come back and, and lever that off. Try prising in here. It does seem to be giving. And our milliamp value is changing. Reasonably confident that is going to come off now. Something is grabbing it centrally, but it does appear to be giving, which is good. Interesting how our resistance is changing. Go. That was quite welcome. Wow, 
what a small motor. Looks as though that bearing has given out. I think that's conclusive. Uh, but in terms of our resistance now, where are we still at 60 milliohm? Let's have a bit of a tidy up in here. It does look as though this has got hot, looking at the discoloration on the inner race of the bearing. Um, there is also, oh, that's very interesting. There looks to be debris. I don't know whether we can bring the camera in here, or maybe if I turn this over, we see we're at 60 milliohm still. And this is what I'm concerned about, is this here. So that fragments of metal, not sure where that is from. Most likely the bearing, maybe the carrier. Yeah, there's discoloration around here. I'm wondering if I can just fetch, hopefully the camera can pick up on that. Yeah. Um, there looks to be some debris wedged between the winding here and the casing. Yet we're clear all the way around here. So if I fetch that out, I wonder whether we can actually... Well, there you are. <laughs> we have a huge resistance change there. We're up to 12,000 milliohm, 1.2 ohm. So that was definitely an area of a short circuit. And that's changing. All right, so this debris, oh, look at this. That there, which I'm trying to fetch out, look at that. Yeah, that looks like a, sorry, that looks like a um, ball carrier for the bearing. So it looks to me now as though the bearing has given out. Um, obviously there's been some um, eccentric rotation. Uh, this break up has ended up between the windings and the casing. Here's another piece coming out now. Hopefully, yeah, can you see that? That's okay. All right, so there we are. In fact, now, we are open circuit, which is exactly what we're after. So an open circuit there means we no longer now have a short between the winding and the casing. With that said, there's obviously damage to the laminate around the coil, uh, which unfortunately deems this um, non-serviceable. Uh, it be interesting to have a look at the insulation test. Now we've fetched that debris out, so we'll repeat the insulation test now. Okay, so we've now got our insulation meter back on, uh, measuring reference to the ground here. We'll go on to the U phase, press the test button. Okay, our test voltage, you know, we still have a short through there. Okay, so I was hoping that that had moved. It may be that there's still some debris left in there. Let's go to the V phase. No, still a short to ground. Finally, the W phase. Okay, so still work to be done, unfortunately. But um, I think at this stage, we know exactly what's wrong and how this uh, winding certainly was shorted to ground. Okay, so I've just cleared a bit more debris from around the spokes of winding here. And uh, this is quite interesting. We're doing insulation chest between you and ground, and just note what happens here. So you can see the sparks there. Yep. So, how about a better short to ground on that one? Uh, we can just go down to V phase. V phase now. Just say open. So, ah, there you are. It's jumping across V phase. Uh, now, W. <laughs> just smell as well. Uh, w phase. There we are. Hope you can see that. So certainly have arcing going on there where that debris was wedged between the windings and the casing. So here is our new or replacement 
second hand transmission assembly with motor and generator you see it connected to the motor so there's our uh, crock click arrangement on this new motor and that's motor assembly okay that one is generator assembly so this is the one that has failed previously so let's run the test now which is a super non-intrusive test because we want to be assured that the windings on this are correct before we actually install and um, temperature probe is not connected at the moment this is just a quick test to evaluate winding resistance so that's good that's a good start hopefully we should see something similar now excellent and then fingers crossed for the final winding and there we go Door open, door closed, foot on brake, ready on. Traction control off, select drive, release brake. Drive the car on ramp. That was 30 mile an hour, with no fault. Put on brake. Select park. Ignition on. Relay clicked under the bonnet. Yeah. That's a full cycle, no faults on the display. Put on brake. Ready on. Traction control off. Select drive. Release the brake pedal. Ready on. Okay, let's have a look at this waveform in a little more detail. So we use the views and auto arrange and voltage phase to phase is kind of what we'd expect to see. Uniformity is there. And let's have a look at current more importantly. And phasing if you remember we were looking at uh, in fact let's reset and let's hide channel a so that way we can see just how the phases align they've still got that sawtooth pattern as we'd sort of highlighted before so that was a bit of a red herring what does look better i think from the previous one is the um, amplitudes they look, although now looking at the, the red there, amplitude seems to dip. Yeah, so we've got um, green and yellow higher, red lower. Remember this is the good motor with no faults. So it is good to see real world analogy and stops us chasing our tail a little bit looks to be peak as well because um, the kind of yeah give or take it's certainly more noticeable on the peak positive than the, the negative all right but nevertheless the conclusion here this sawtooth was a bit of a red herring because it is present on the second hand motor and once again remember no faults with this motor
Brake on. Brake off. Overrun. Drive. I'm driving the vehicle now as in buying gas. Now overrun. Next stop. Here is our XY view captured in the previous video in Picoscope 6 and now we can view in Picoscope 7. So let's just go back through the time domain here and we can see how XY view changes with respect to speed. And let's come back up to how we're accelerating. So I think it's around here. There we are. Okay, and we'll zoom in here into the time domain and that does surprise me just how um, I don't know what the word is for that whether that's aggressive current or I know it's, it's a bit beyond sawtooth but it would almost makes you think that there could be a fault with that but um, looking at the circle they are good this is uh, U, V and W plotted against one another uh, remember when you're looking in the XY view, you want, let me, sorry, let me click on here, you want your aspect ratio one to one as on. And let's apply some filtering now. So where it says filter, that's the bandwidth limit filter, because we, when you plug a current clamp on, you automatically get 20 kilohertz bandwidth limit. Let's put low pass filtering on now. And, um, you know, when we go down to one kilohertz, I think there we are that takes away that sawtooth completely and also uh, smooths out the circle so there we are um, good to see both before and after filtering because it does surprise me just how um, aggressive that sawtooth is and how sporadic it is as well but this is the motor without a fault this vehicle is now okay no fault codes no isolation error Put on brake, ready on, traction control on, select drive, put on brake, select park, ready off. Here is the waveform for analysis for post fix. This is differential probe U phase to HV negative. And there's a different strategy here because it looks like we were off and rolling straight away. We can see that in the current, whereas in our original capture, I think our generator cut in. So there would be a different strategy to counteract that um, effect on the motor, followed by when I then put my foot down on the gas pedal and the motor rotated. So let's just have a look. Um, all we've got to do is zoom in and just see if there's anything here that rings alarm bells. There's that sorted. Let's get rid of the current for a second because that's it's not really the current that we we need to analyze. So let's get rid of those. And uh, there's not a lot to see, is there really? This is the good motor, remember. And perhaps the best way to compare is to use the reference waveforms. So um, let's go to views. I've already created the reference waveform. So here's the waveform from before fix. Now it was actually captured on a different time scale. So let me just go back. This was the original capture uh, on five second divisions. And what I meant by strategy was um, at this point here I don't believe the wheels were rotating when you actually listen to the video you can hear the point where the wheels were rotating and it was here it looks like uh, this prior was the holding strategy because the generator had cut in nevertheless um, 
we can use the delay feature of reference waveforms. So what's nice here is although it was captured on a different time frame, we can drag the uh, entire waveform back in. And as I said in the video, it was toward the end of the capture, uh, the original, where the full code appeared. So it would have been in here. So if I just zoom in on this area here, and yeah, we, we couldn't see anything. There's no difference between these. If I slide this up here, similar voltages, very similar. Um, nothing to prove, nothing to gain from that test, unfortunately, but if we don't test, we don't know. Uh, on the next buffer, we've got this um, this event here, haven't we? This is where we kind of switch off and this tapers away. Then there's sort of a downtime and there's this kind of discharge event or I don't know, some kind of um, uh, in, induction maybe, I, I really don't know, but uh, let's compare it with, um, sorry, let's go to views and compare it with the one on the uh, prefix, the previous motor. So to avoid confusion, let's take that one away. So now we're looking at the blue is the, the new motor and this purple color is the old one. And in terms of, let's try and get them on the same scale. Voltage wise, this inductive peak or event, discharge event, wherever it may be, they're the same. Um, there is something here, isn't there? If we look where this starts to decay, by comparison to the decay on the good motor, there could be something there. I, I really don't know. Once again, food for thought. But to, con uh, to draw a conclusive diagnosis from that, I think we'd be hard pushed. But I'm glad we've discussed it. So there you have it. Thanks for hanging on in there because it does go on a bit. But there's a lot of techniques, hopefully, that we can use moving forward. Some that were good in this scenario, others not so good. That doesn't mean to say that they're not going to be useful on other uh, diagnostic cases. Uh, I think the giveaway was the, um, the sense and pre-check on the isolation uh, detector, so the ground fault leak detector, that was useful, as was isolation and milliohm testing, and that brought me round to how far we've come so far in a very short space of time, because this case study was, well, it's, it's coming up to 12 months old. Uh, we didn't have XY view in Picoscope 6, we do now, uh, in Picoscope 7 now, sorry. Uh, we didn't have the milliohm meter. It was a prototype in the actual case study. We now have that released. And of course, isolation testing and all other techniques that sort of guided us through to a conclusion. So I hope that helps and thank you for watching.